to be here. All right, we are live. Uh, we're talking in chapter 10 of uh, Brace for Impact, chapter 10, part 2. There's, you know, there's 10 parts of chapter 10, basically 10 verses, and we're looking at promises. But these promises are promises are not like promises in the sense that God's going to bless you, but in the time of difficulty, in the time of hardship, when we face persecution, God is talking about promises of giving you strength, uh, of giving you uh, a, a perspective of eternity, of coming alongside and enabling you to endure, withstand. Have you got everything working okay, Tony? Oh, 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 seven. Okay, and we're not used to having that much attention. Uh, but the promises that are, are not just like blessings of, of material things, but in a sense strength in this age to overcome, to endure, and to produce. And what we're looking at tonight is strength and weakness. It's a verse you're familiar with. It comes out of 2 Corinthians, and I'm going to read it here first. In, in 2 Corinthians, Paul is, is dealing with a church. It's Actually, that was what we know. There's, we got First and 2 Corinthians. There's actually four letters written to the Corinthian church as you read through the letters. We've got 2nd and 4th Corinthians. We call them 1st and 2nd. They're the only ones we've got. But there was a previous letter written. Paul then writes what we call 1st Corinthians. And then he writes a harsh letter, 3rd Corinthians, which we do not have. And then he writes the 4th letter, 4th Corinthians, which would be called 2nd Corinthians, if that makes sense. And so in 2nd Corinthians, he's addressing kind of the the final part of the problem that they've been working through as a church. What has happened is there's been people within the church have turned, they didn't want to come all the way with Christianity. They wanted to begin to pick and choose the parts they wanted, but to keep their Greek philosophy, to keep their rhetoricians, the, the great speakers, and kind of combine Greek philosophy with Christianity. It's every culture wants to take their culture and combine it with Christianity. Uh, it, it's, it's normal, and sometimes it's appropriate to be culturally relevant, but in this case, they were actually watering down Christianity. Even in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, they wanted to get rid of the resurrection. They wanted to believe in the resurrection and other things. What had taken place was there was what was called, Paul refers to them as super apostles or super speakers that had come into the church as the church had grown, the people had gathered. Uh, there's a power base there, and so people wanted to become part of it and rise up as far as leadership positions, and they became super apostles. And they began to expound. And he was saying that mockingly, making fun of them, because he was such a, what we would say, weak apostle. It's during this series of, of letters, First and Second Corinthians, that Paul talks about that he wasn't a great speaker, that he wasn't uh, well-trained. And you get, well, Paul is like, well, he was very well trained. He was trained in the school of Gamaliel as a rabbi, so he was, he was also trained legally. He, was, he could speak as a lawyer. He could, he could reason like a Pharisee and as a Bible scholar. So he was very well trained. But what he was comparing himself to was one of these great speakers that would come in. And rhetoric was a, a thing that was very important in the Roman Empire because they began to realize early that people that could, now watch this, that could persuade crowds of people with their speech had greater political power if you could persuade with your speech the people to follow you. So you had the, the military strength, but you also had the strength of numbers. Uh, it's a basic principle. Uh, you realize, I, I realize it every time we have a, a pep rally at school and you've got your handful of staff members and then you have all the students come in into the gym and sit in the gym as a, as a mass of students and realize how many much more power there is in the bleachers than there is on staff. We've got a bunch of teachers say, stop that, don't do that, stop, 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 correct. And then you got all the students say, we're not going to listen to anybody, and they could just overwhelm the staff very easily. And uh, you just hope the students never get to the place to realize how much power is in the student body. Uh, but the point here is there was power within the groups of people, and Rome realized that, Greece re realized that, that if you could train someone to speak and persuade them with words, uh, you could sway them before you even had to use the military. And it became a political tool they used. It called, and they, they were trained. And you look at all the guys that went to school back in Greece and early Rome. They were all trained in rhetoric. They were all trained in speech. And Paul was saying that he was weak. He was not trained as a speaker. 
He was trained as a, a lawyer, as a theologian, as a reasoner, as a teacher, as a communicator, uh, as a Pharisee, and a communicator of the law of Moses. So when he says he was weak in his speech, he doesn't mean he couldn't communicate. He wasn't a fluffy uh, politician and dancing around manipulating the audience. That's really what he's talking about. But these super apostles had come in and they were, we could just say that, they were manipulators. They could manipulate the crowd because they'd been trained in manipulation. And they came into the church and they began to manipulate the people away from Paul, away from the hardcore doctrines, getting rid of things like the resurrection. And that's where you see in 1 Corinthians that Paul compares the wisdom of the world to the foolishness of the cross. Because on the cross, uh, Jesus was a criminal in the Roman world that was been crucified, but the wisdom of, of the world would, would mock that. But over here, in the wisdom of God, Christ was dying for the sins of the world. This was the whole plan of God. So the plan of God was foolishness to the world, and the world was wise. And that's what Paul was competing against in Corinth. And he was losing the church, and they were turning against him. They came to faith in the cross, but the world convinced them that was foolish, and they should bring some of the things over here, like the spiritual power, like the authority, bring it over here, and combine it with the wisdom of the world. And ah, this was selling. Now again, I don't want to make a connection to the modern Western church, but it, I could go off right here, and you have a very similar thing happening with great speakers and mega churches with words of wisdom, but they don't have time for the foolishness of teaching verse by verse through the actual Word of God, which will never pass away, while everything they're talking about is in the process of passing away, and it's not eternal, but we're talking about it, living for it, and we're ignoring the things that are eternal. So Paul begins... Uh, in, in, and again, this, these, some of these verses are, are very heated as he's ripping on these people. Uh, and in chapter 12, it begins uh, 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 him saying, I must go on boasting. Although there's nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. And he'd gotten to the point where he, in, in, in 2 Corinthians, where he basically says, okay, listen, you want to play the game, you want to play the game of who is super, who is a super apostle. You could just see him, I mean, the, again, I, I'm, I'm ab-libbing, I'm, I'm acting out, you know, maybe being a little overzealous in it. But he was talking about, uh, you want to talk about who the super apostles are. It's not these guys. He says, I will talk about myself and the things I'm going to. Finally, Paul says, okay, you want to start laying down credentials? You want to start bragging about doing things for God? Well, all right, I will, I will just flat out give you my resume. And he's going through and talking about all the things he's done. He talks about it in chapter 11. And then in chapter 12, he says, uh, I must go on boasting. And the reason he's saying, I must go on boasting, is he's dropping down to their level of bragging on achievements so that he can communicate with them. He's trying to rescue them from the false apostles and bring them back to the truth. He says, okay, I will go down here and talk. And now, the book of Proverbs has this. It's got two verses, and they're contradictory. And, and, and I usually, I have, usually when I go through these, this part of Scripture, I have them in the notes. But one of them says... Answer a fool according to his folly, otherwise he'll think he's wise in his own eyes. In other words, if a fool is thinking that this is all the way it is, and you're over here talking at a very intellectual, reasonable level, they, they won't be able to communicate, and they're going to think, you just can't answer my, problem, my, my issues. I, I've got all the answers, and you're talking over here. It's like, And so it's like, okay, well, I've got to go over here and play this game. And you drop down to the level of a fool and communicate at this level, and all of a sudden, you destroy them at the game of being a fool, and you can prove them at their level. So it says, answer a fool according to his folly, otherwise they'll think they're wise in their own eyes. But then it also says, do not answer a fool according to their folly, otherwise they'll think they're wise in their eyes. In other words, there's a, and this, is, this is wisdom. This is where wis there's knowledge, which is just facts, and knowledge would be answer a fool according to his, his, uh, as, as a fool. And also knowledge, do not answer a fool as a fool. Stay over here. What is wisdom? Wisdom is knowing which time it's appropriate to use that tool. There is a hammer and there is a screwdriver. 
So, well, I thought you said where this, you use a hammer and you use, well, they're both tools, but you've got to know when to use the tool. Sometimes you've got to answer a fool according to his folly to defeat him. Sometimes if you go there, they've won the battle. I'm not going to talk at that level. I'm going to stay over here. And that calls for wisdom. Paul in chapter 12 has decided, he's been trying to stay over here saying, I'm not going to go over here and speak as a fool because you consider my wisdom, the wisdom of God, foolishness, and the world is actually foolish. And he's trying to be reasoning with him over here at this point. Finally, in chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians, it's like, all right, you want to play this game? You stinking want to play super apostle? All right, here I go. And he's been boasting in chapter 11 about all the things he's done. And now in chapter 12, he's going to go into two areas of boasting about his own, in a sense, ability as an apostle. But it's going to, sh- it's going to very quickly, it's going to very quickly shift from the world wisdom of the world he's gonna he looks like he's aiming this way it's like gonna, there'd be ooh ah but about the time he comes over here he's gonna make a drastic turn back to the cross and do a 180 on him and while he's pulling over there go ooh ah paul you're amazing tell us more about your visions and your dreams wow what was it like in heaven he goes boom comes back over here and he ends up back at the cross at the point of weakness and foolishness and he says and hopefully he's drugged them back over here because over here in the wisdom of the world it's not eternal there's no value in that sense because the world and its desires are passing away and so if you have to as paul is doing here hook the world but bring it back to the cross and paul is doing that very thing so you can hear that take place here in chapter 12 and here we go chapter 12 verse 1 i must go on boasting although there is nothing to be gained i will go on to visions and revelations uh, from the lord Now, he's going to talk about visions and revelations, meaning things that he has seen supernaturally. Because they want to be impressed with the supernatural. These guys that are the rhetoricians, they can have visions and dreams and interpretations. And Paul wants to stick with the text. He wants to stick with the basic revelation of God's word. And he says, okay, you want to go on to visions and revelations? He says, I will. Then Now he says, it's almost as if he doesn't have the actual ability to say, I had this experience. But he comes as close, and you've got to decide if he does or not. He comes as close to it as he can because he says this. He says, I know a man in Christ, meaning I know a Christian, who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Caught up means taken up like rapture he was transported translated maybe like enoch maybe like but he went from the temporal world and in the jewish mind as he's speaking uh this is the way it works the earth is the first level the atmosphere atmosphere is the second level and then you're going to have the third level which is called the third heaven so this is the first heaven the second heaven, and the third heaven. We're not talking about there's, when you go to heaven, there's level one, level two, level three, and God's on the third level. We're talking about almost using the term heaven as in level or place of existence. And the first level was the earth. The second level or second heaven was the atmosphere. And again, when you say atmosphere, I mean, when, when does that stop? at the atmosphere and then you've got some spiritual level of heaven that is leveled up here and then you've got the stars and the universe or when does this break down that's another conversation but he was taken his point was he was here and he was taken into the third heaven he was taken into he wasn't on the earth he wasn't floating in space he was taken into the spiritual dimension when he says third heaven he was taken into well he's going he's going to say it again for you so you have no doubt about it i was caught up to the third heaven now watch this, whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. He says, so he says this was an experience that I can't even explain. It was my body on the earth and I was just there spiritually, or did I actually, my body, tra-? he says, I don't know. It, meaning, this is beyond my understanding, he's even saying. 
He says, whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, and he says again, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise. And so now, again, th this is the third heaven. It's the presence of God. It's now paradise. Just a side note, remember, paradise was in the heart of the earth. It's Sheol in the Old Testament, uh, Hades in the New Testament, and paradise was that positive side of the underworld. In the Old Testament, people went down to paradise. Uh, we can see it. We give any examples. But upon Jesus' resurrection, paradise has moved into the third heaven. The captivity has been led captive. Now people say, well, that's weird. How can paradise or the underworld move? Well, it's not so weird because when you hear in Revelation, the rest of Sheol or Hades, the place of torment, is eventually going to be thrown into the lake of fire, which is another something somewhere in the spiritual dimension. So this, upon Jesus' resurrection, or ascension, you can discuss that, was taken into the third heaven or into the presence of God, and paradise is now in heaven today. Just like in the future, Hades itself, the place of torment in the heart of the earth, will be thrown into the lake of fire. In fact, it says it specifically, Hades will be thrown into the lake of fire in the book of Revelation. So that anyway, that's paradise. So that's where we know where he's at. He's caught up to paradise. Now watch what happens there. He heard inexpressible things that man is not permitted to tell an interesting verse he is going to go here into the third heaven as a man and he's going to hear things and we can say see things experience things be exposed to things that man is not permitted to tell now you got to kind of play this out what is he saying that god is going to tell him a bunch of secrets but when you go back shh you can't say anything about this. I saw, but I can't tell you what I saw. I mean, you could read it that way, or he sees it, but he is not permitted because he does not have the, the faculty, the facility, the comprehension to understand what he saw, or yet come back and in human language express what he saw and make sense of what he saw. If you want to try it, try Ezekiel seeing the cherubim with the wheels within the wheels as the son of man moved in it's like and he's describing it's like what what a, and it's like when you see all oh, it, it's it's it looks like a combination of animals and creatures and they've got four faces on one head it's like oh what it sounds like you know in the 70s they say he was on lsd or something and, and that, that wasn't the case uh but it's like you're seeing things that are not of we don't have any uh, framework to deal with it so i think paul is saying now again, he's boasting, he's trying to play the super apostle because they want someone special, someone who is beyond. He goes, you, you want to hear me boast? I'll tell you, 14 years ago, I was taken into the presence of God, in the paradise itself. I don't even know if I was in my body or out of my body, but I saw things that no one has ever seen before, and I can't even begin to tell you what I saw. It was so far, I don't even know where I was, if I was in a body, out of the body, let alone tell you what I was looking at. But I was there. I saw these things. The, ooh, and now the question, now the hands go up. We got some questions. Of course you do. Buy my book, get my cassette tape series or my CD series. It's like, I've got some videos I'd like to sell you. You know, just, just if you want to make money, just spend a summer and get creative and write, if you, you pretend you died and you went into heaven, and you saw something, and then write a book about it. And you'll get on radio shows, talk shows. It's like this, but you better get your story straight because people are going to start asking questions. And you better be, and the wilder and more detailed it is, the more excited they're going to be. But that's ridiculous because people have done that. They went to heaven and wrote a book and became, and they travel, which is interesting because Paul also went to heaven. The third heaven, paradise itself. The apostle in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And he came back and says, I don't know, I have no idea what I saw. Man is not permitted to say these things. But yet today in the 21st century, we got people writing books about it. When I went to heaven, here's what I saw. Boy, I sure wish Paul had that kind of ability. He said, man can't do that. Anyway, uh, just a side note when you start judging people writing books. He heard this man, he says, heard inexpressible things that man is not permitted to tell. He says, I will boast about a man like that, 
but I will not boast about myself except about my weakness. He says, he says I, I, this was impressive, but he's not even willing to say it was himself. And so, some people would say it wasn't himself. He says, I'm not going to talk about that, but now that I've got your attention, yes, you do. I, we, we, we have some questions. Yes, I know you do, but while I've got your attention, I'm not going to boast about that man, but I know a man that had that experience. But while I've got your attention, I want to go back and talk about my weakness. Because this is where you live. You don't live in some supernatural world where you can fly off to heaven and have visions and revelations and start manipulating people with all the desires you want. You are stuck in a state of weakness. And we're going to get into this right now. He says, well, let me read it to you here in the NIV. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool. In other words, if I would choose, I would not be a fool because that really happened to me. Because I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain so that no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. Now imagine if Paul had written a book about his experience, and that became one of the books in the Bible, and that became the, the measuring stick of spirituality. If that became the measuring stick, have you had a vision? Well, I had a little one, okay? Have you been visited by an angel? Maybe, but I'm not sure. Some guy stopped and helped me change my tire one time, and it was really dark and rainy, and it might have been an angel. Okay, okay. So you've had a little vision. You may have had an encounter with an angel. Now, have you ever gone into heaven? Well, one time I had a really strange dream. So now it becomes, now did you, what kind of angel experience you had? Okay, and what kind of vision did you see? What was it like when you saw heaven? It's like, well, I haven't been there yet. Now this is called the Meribah or Merkabah uh, revelation of, of Colossians. The book of Colossians is all about this, shutting down this kind of desire to work through the levels of the spiritual mission until you reach and you see a vision of God. Now, for example, Isaiah saw a vision of God in, on his throne. Ezekiel saw the, the wheel with him, the, the, the son of man on the chariot. They've seen these things, and, and so there are other legends and things, and so they would try to work through these levels. Paul right here shuts that all down, says, I was there, and I'm saying nothing more about it. He says, I'm just talking about a man that I know that had that experience. He says, but if I were to tell you about it, it would be true because it really happened. But let's focus now. Let's get back to the point. That's not the standard of Christian spirituality. How weird you can get. How many visions you can have. How close to heaven you can come. The book of Colossians is all about, not all about that, but it's heavy in the book of Colossians, trying to tear that structure down. He says the key, the thing you're going to experience every day is you're going to be living in weakness. Now, we've talked about this before. Well, I'm not weak. I'm a healthy, middle-aged man. Well, elderly uh, getting older not as healthy as i used to be but pretty good and, and, and it's like and I, i've got a job i've got a and you got all these things i'm not weak okay listen we're all so vulnerable and we're if it, if it be health if it be age if it be finances if it just be death itself that's creeping up on us not to mention, give yourself all the money in the world, give yourself all the health in the world, say so you can lock yourself in time and never age. You still are living with a sin nature that is in rebellion towards your desire to follow God and in rebellion towards God that wants to revolt again. And you're dealing with that every day. Every time you want, Paul says in Romans, he says, every time I want to do good, evil is right there with me wanting to go the other way. It's like, how do I, you're, you're in the point of the New Testament, you're never going to get rid of that. You're always going to have the sin nature until you lay your body down and you pass on into eternity. So even the great apostle knew what it was like to live in weakness. And this is the point. If you start thinking too much about how good you are, how great your vision is, uh, how healthy you are, how much money you've got, it's like, whoa, understand, stay focused on the fact that you're weak. You start just trusting in your strength, in your ability. Now, again, God gives you strength. God gives you ability. But you've got to keep that in, in perspective with how weak you are, beginning with the sin nature. And Paul says this right here. He says, I'm not going to boast about a man that went to heaven. 
He says, because I don't want that to be your standard. I don't want you to measure me as an apostle and my message of an apostle because, oh, he went to heaven. Someday I hope to be like Paul. He says, look at me. I'm a man with weakness. This is where we live. Well, here we go. But I refrain so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. To keep me, now this is some tough verses. To keep me from becoming conceited or becoming too exalted. And the different ways of understanding. Paul may be exalted in, in Paul's mind, like he saw this and he became proud. Or he saw this and he's got these experiences and others would give him more credit, like he himself was great. Now again, Paul was a great man. He'd had a great calling, but he was a man that God had called and put into a position. So Paul's going to give all the credit to Jesus Christ. Yes, Paul did great. We're still reading his books today, but it's because Christ used him for his purpose. Now, stay with me. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations. So he did understand some of the things, for example, uh, who Christ was and the resurrection. He began to talk about things, Christ, in a way that the, the, the apostles that traveled with Jesus didn't explain as clearly, like being seated with Christ, of Christ being exalted above the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. So Paul had an understanding uh, that he combined with the other apostles' teaching, and they approved it. Even Peter, in his final book, says some of the things Paul writes are hard to understand because paul was writing from a different perspective a different angle he was going to the gentiles but he was also seeing he'd had some revelation from the lord that peter didn't have and peter reads paul's now he says this some of the things paul writes are hard to understand that uh, unstable people ignorant and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures huge statement by paul Peter, in 64 or 63 AD, probably 64, because that's when Peter was executed in the beginning of the Nero persecutions. By 64 AD, Peter, the, uh, one of the apostles that traveled with Jesus, was able to say, people are twisting and distorting the teachings and writings of Paul just like they do the other scriptures. He doesn't say just like they do scripture. He says just like they do the other scripture. Peter, before he died, stamped Paul's writings as Scripture, equal with the Old Testament. These are revelations from God. This is God revealing his truth through an apostle. That's Peter giving Paul a stamp of approval. Not just his ministry, but his writings. But yet he says, they are hard to understand. And so Paul had a perspective here, that, and he has revelations. Okay, but the point here. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there has given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan. Oh, this rocks boats right here. It was given to him a, a thorn in the flesh. Now, again, I, 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 I got to get to the point of what we're talking about. A thorn would be something that, that was bothering him. For example, to go back into the Old Testament, the uh, uh, the Canaanites were not driven out and they became a thorn in the side of the Israelites because they, weren't, they were still there causing them hassle. Anything that causes you difficulty. A thorn in my flesh, that flesh would mean, uh, it, it's sarke in the Greek, uh, it means flesh. It is a reference to, it can mean like the physical body, but it can also be a, a word, an overreaching word for the sin nature or the nature of man. So this, this flesh uh, compared to spirit, which would be considered, you know, the, the righteous part of man after being born again. Again, I'm just giving you examples. This thorn can be uh, a, a person or a group of people. It could be someone that's causing him trouble in his ministry, maybe the Judaizers, the Jews that were coming against his message. It could be the Gentiles that were resisting him. Uh, and it was in his flesh. It can be his physical body or it could be in his human nature as a whole, which would include his sin nature. And it is called a messenger of Satan. So now a messenger of Satan gives it a personality, if you would, of something that was sent to him. Uh, was it sent by Satan? As we read on to the, again, I'm just, I'm just throwing these, the, the, breaking this down. There was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan, to torment me. 
So this thing is sent to Paul to slow him down, to torment him, to cause him trouble, like the Canaanites caused, caused Israel the trouble, or the Judaizers were causing Paul trouble. Something that was sent to him, because of these visions and revelations, this was sent to him. Now, was this Satan attacking him? Or was this giving Satan permission to send this messenger? Now, you can, you can discuss that either way, but either way could be right. But most likely, either way, you've got to include the idea that God is giving permission. Because you've got the book of Job. Satan came to God, and God says, have you considered my servant Job? And then Satan said, you know, he's only worshiping you because he's got all this stuff. God said, well, take it from him. Then Satan came back. God says, well, you know, you took all this stuff. He's still worshiping me. Ah, yeah, but you strike his body, he'll stop worshiping you. God said, well, go ahead, strike his body, but don't kill him. So he struck his body. He comes back, God says, he's still worshiping me. So you have that example you can't get away from unless you're going to do some kind of exegetical linguistic gymnastics to get away from it. Then you've got Jesus at the Lord's Supper with these apostles telling him, Satan has asked me to let him sift you like wheat. Now, if Satan asked Jesus if he could sift Galen like we just shake him up and see what he's made out of, I would hope Jesus would say, no, no, you can't. You're the devil. No, get back in your box. But then he tells Peter, but I've prayed for you. When you recover, strengthen your brothers. What do you mean when I recover? Well, Satan asked to shake you. He's going to sift you like wheat. Well, you said no, right? No, he's, he wants to test to see what you're made out of. So, when you recover, when I recover, I mean I'm going to fall? Well, Satan's going to sift you like wheat. Of course you're going to fall. You're going you're to fall apart. But you're going to recover. I'm not liking this Christian stuff at all. I want, I want like, a, put me in a bubble wrap or something. Jesus, when he got baptized, where did the Spirit lead him? To a safe place. To a safe place where no one would bother him. no. After his baptism, the Spirit led him directly into the wilderness so he might be tempted by Satan for 40 days. It's like, what kind of crazy God do we got? I, I want God to, I'm going to come to, I'm going to become a Christian and God can protect me. It's like, yeah, he, he's here to make you grow. And it, Satan's not locked up in the lake of fire uh, and is still on earth for a purpose. Well, why can't God stop him? Well, he can, but he's chosen to let things run their course. And part of the plan is Satan's still here and you've been born into time right here and there's going to be confrontation. It's like, well, this is scary stuff. Right. But when you recover, strengthen your brothers. Oh, oh, well, here, here it is right here. So however you break it down, this is Paul saying about his own life. Now, he, remember, he's bragging. He's in competition with the super apostles that have great rhetor ret speaking skills, rhetoricians. And they've got great ways of manipulating the crowd and swaying people. And they're skilled at this. And they're stealing Christians and leading them astray from the church. Now, they're still calling it church. They're still calling it Christ. But they're twisting the doctrines. So Paul comes in and tries to say, listen, you want to see someone impressive. I, I can show you some impressive stuff. Look, I've had visions. I've gone to the third heaven. But let me tell you something more important. I'm going to tell you about my weakness. He says, I have been given a thorn in the flesh, some problem in his body, in his nature, a messenger of Satan to torment me. So what did he do? What all Christians should do? They go to God in prayer. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. So whatever, and people at, dance all around trying to figure out what it was. Was it the Judaizers that followed him? Please get rid of these Judaizers. Uh, was it uh, uh, his, uh, his ability? Was he, he stuttered? Uh, they, they say, some, th some say it was some kind of epilepsy, maybe from getting stoned and, and damaged to his body, that he had some kind of physical ailment. Uh, they, they don't know what it was, but it, it, we, we, this doesn't say. We can take guesses at it. I'm going to give you some more clues as we go through this. But anyway, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Remember, Jesus healed the masses. 
I mean, Jesus healed individuals. They came to him, and he says, they says if you're willing, you can heal me. And Jesus said, I am, be healed. G- Paul goes, if you're willing, you can heal me. And, and God says, no. Not like, no, I'm not going to help you. You're a loser. I reject you. But no, 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 you're fine. This is, this is what I'm talking about in chapter 10, part 2 is we have to be able to understand, we have to be able to wrap our mind around this. Yes, God will answer our prayers, but when God doesn't answer our prayers, it's still fine. Because he has then, in a sense, answered. And I'm not talking about God being silent. I'm talking about God saying, we're fine. We're fine. I want this fixed. And sometimes God will fix it. I want to be led out of this confusion. And God will lead you out of the confusion. But sometimes we ask for things, and God says, wait, wait, wait. This is fine. You don't need this problem resolved. What you need is to find strength in me because my, your, my, your strength in me is greater than anything you can get in yourself. Now, on, this, on the book that I wrote, bottom of page 62, uh, I'm going to just read this because I, I, it, it was brilliant when I wrote it last summer, so I don't want to try to repeat it. I say that facetiously. Uh, there was no need to resolve Paul. I'm in the middle of page 62. There's no need to resolve Paul's present affliction or weakness since God was manifesting his divine power in that situation instead of letting him rely on his own limited human power. Now I write, and this is nothing radical, there is human strength that can manifest as the power of the will. And obviously there's times where we need to call on these things god has given us the power of the will such as determination it's time for you to just decide you're going to get the job done and determine you're going to do it not sit on the couch and say well i'm just trusting jesus i'm just trusting jesus uh, I'm, god is going to give me the strength i'm just waiting for it well he's giving you the strength naturally he's giving you self-will you've got determination get the yard mode for example and that's that's the power of the human will we all have it or physical strength such as endurance running you can sit on the couch and say well i just feel so weak i feel so weak well or you can start working out you can get up and move around you can do stuff and and maintain physical health god has given you physical health use it and you're physically healthy it's a gift from god it's natural gift from god god is revealing himself in creation in nature he's giving you strength use that strength train that strength develop that strength it's natural it's good god's gift Or the power of the intellect, such as unraveling the mysteries of chemistry. It's like, well, I'm just going to pray that God develops a a medicine that God sends like manna from heaven, a cure for cancer. It's like, or if you've got the mental capacity and you understand these mysteries of the universe, you can use math and you can use chemistry and you can come up with some solutions and people have. It's like, that is natural intellect. Use that. We would like to excel in all of these. And it is natural that when we lose the power of our will, now you can lose power of your will, you can, for some reason, you can lose your physical strength, or you can lose intellectual strength, or you can be limited, or you can be harassed, or you can be distracted, you can have confusion in life, you can be trying to go too many directions at the same time, and you can be in a state of weakness. Now, Paul is saying this right here. Uh, he says, there, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me because he wanted to go back to his, if it be intellectual ability or his desire to control his own will or maybe his own health. If you could let me be healthy, let me be healthy and I could get more done. I could travel faster. If you would help me have a clear mind, I could be more intellectual and be a better communicator. Or if I could have you know, more endurance or whatever it was, I could perform better. And God is saying, no, no, no. You don't need, it. now again, I'm not saying, by no means saying power of the will, physical strength, or power of the intellect is bad. I'm just saying in this case, God is saying, that's not what we need right here, Paul. You're fine just where you're at. What you need to do is take your eye off of your weakness and start looking for something bigger. And here it is right here. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me so that he could somehow restore his natural ability. But he said to me, and this is in red letters in my Bible, and this happened three times, my grace is sufficient for you, 
for my power is made perfect in weakness. He says, you don't need, again, we don't know what it is. You don't need to be healed of this situation. You don't need to be delivered from this harassment you're getting from the Judaizers. You don't need to have greater physical strength or become younger or whatever it is. What you need to do is reach out for more grace. I am giving you all that you need because it says right here, my grace is sufficient. Meaning what I want you to do, I'm giving you everything you need right now. And you've got your eye on, I need this or that natural ability or natural correction in my life. He says, no, you've got everything you need. It's like, yeah, but I've got this problem. Christ said, I don't consider that a problem. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness when you are in that state of weakness you can't physically do it you can't intellectually figure it out you can't endure and go there you're just going to have to say I-, I need help for example i can give you an example when paul is locked up in prison this was this would be uh 56 a.d so by 57 AD, Paul's in prison. By 62 AD, he's going to be released from prison. He'll be put back in prison sometime in 67 AD. While he's in prison in Rome, after this book, about a year or so after this book, well, it'll be three years or four years after this book, he'll be in prison in Caesarea by the sea, right where that's at, right there, uh, in about two years. He is able, from being in prison, he'll be in prison in Caesarea and Rome for five years. He is able to write and run a ministry, uh, uh, in a sense, a worldwide ministry with people coming and going, coming and meeting with him, and write Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians and uh, Philemon and and make communication with the Roman church while he's under house arrest with chains on. It's like, now this is not what he's praying about here, but this 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 situation in 2 Corinthians would set the stage for where he's going to be in prison. And he's, he seems to be fine. It's like, Paul, aren't you trying to escape? It's like, uh, God's grace is made perfect in weakness. I mean, his strength is, I, I'm going further and faster with these letters I'm writing than if I was floating around on a boat trying to get there to speak. And then again, he's arrested in 66, 67, well, 67 AD. And he writes 2 Timothy. And you have that, we'll look at some verses there. The same relaxed attitude. of and We're talking about staying in the faith rest of just saying yeah i i i could be faster i I could be smarter i could be less harassed i could have a clearer direction i could be less confusing i could be less busy but god's not going to change that i've asked now we're going to read a verse going to god and asking can you fix this i'm confused can you give me direction i'm sick can you heal me i need i'm broken I, i need this fixed or whatever it's like and God can do that. He says, yes, we need this fixed. And God can correct that. But there's a chance God will say, not a problem. Your problem is you're not looking at me. Your, your problem is you're not trusting in the strength that I'm giving you. In your weakness, you're going to have strength in Christ. And if you, if you get rid of this weakness and you find human power, you're going to lose the strength of Christ. It's like, I've got this. And you're going to have your self-will, you're going to have your self-determination, you're going to have your own effort, and you're going to produce what we'd say in, 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 the, in the example of wood, hay, and straw, and it's going to be, it's going to be burned up and consumed. Where if you say, I, I don't have the ability, and God says, come here, I'll, I'll give you strength. This is not going to look like a good plan. This is not going to look like a good plan. But trust me, we're going to reach perfection. Now, this is not human perfection, as you became perfect but god is going to get his job done what i want to accomplish with your life is going to reach perfection but i'm not even at full speed i'm not even got my full i'm i'm limping here right because if you were going full speed you'd be trusting your power and we'd never get my perfect plan because you can't get perfection out of human power so in your weakness you've got to go to god's strength and once you're in god's strength He's got it from there. You just keep trying. And Paul, look what he did. I mean, remember, from 57 
to 67, he was in prison for five, maybe six or seven years. I would say at least six years because you get a five years in the first imprisonment, at least a year or so the second imprisonment right around there. But that's in a 10-year period. He had over half of his time in prison and it was some of his most productive times. The letters come from that time. Plus, he went to Spain in his free time. He got to Spain and back. Apparently, it would be guess. So watch this. What's Paul's response? Now remember, he's talking to Corinthians who are filled with pride and arrogance following the manipulators and the great speakers, the great rhetoricians that are the politicians that are manipulating the crowd to come this way. And Paul just says, listen, I've been there. I've done all that. I've, I've been to heaven and saw heaven. But what I have learned is what counts is trusting God's strength. In fact, I've been in a place where I'm so weak, I need, I need to be cured, I need to be fixed, I need this removed from me. But God says he's not because in my weakness, well, I'll read it again. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Did Paul understand this? Yes, he did, and watch this. Therefore, and this, was, this is going right back to chapter 1 and 2 of 1 Corinthians. The foolishness of the cross is greater than the wisdom of the world. And he went, they, they were still pushing for the wisdom of the world. He went there and dabbling, ah, visions, revelations, I saw things that no man can express, and brings back, well, I'm going to talk about my weakness. And then he says, therefore, if you want to hear me boast, it's not going to be about the great visions. It's not going to be about my, my training in Jerusalem. It's not going to be how many miles I've traveled, how many churches I've reached. It's going to be this right here. He says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness. Five things. For Christ's sake, I delight, I find joy, I find completion, I find fulfillment in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The more you try and drive me down, the more Satan sends a messenger to drive me into the ground and bury me. It's like, you understand, you're coming against me, the man. But I'm just reaching for God's strength, and he's just pumping his strength in me. Nothing I've earned or deserved, this is by grace. And I start rising up, and I'm reaching perfection in God's call in my life. Not because of my will, not because of my intellect, not because of my desire, my endurance, but because I'm just saying, I'm just following God. And God is just using me for what he created me to be. And it's like, it's, 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 rever it's like, how does that even make sense? The same way the Messiah being killed on a cross saved the world and was God's perfect plan. That was God's perfect plan. Mm -hmm. I thought we killed the Messiah. Right. That was God's perfect plan. You kill him, he saves the world, resurrects him, and the rulers and authorities are totally defeated. Oh, they didn't see that coming. Right. Because it says, Paul writes here in, in Corinthians, he writes, because if the rulers of this age had understood it, they would never have crucified the king of glory. If they understood that in our weakness we become strong, they would just back off. They, just let the humans alone. They'll devour each other like the progressives. It's like, just let them devour each other. It's like, they'll just, they're nothing, they're not logical. They're sinful. And if you just let them run their course, they become powerful, rich, and wealthy. They'll just consume each other. But instead, they're trying to attack us with weaknesses and, and make us weak. And if we keep trying to fight back with human power, we're going to miss this strength right here. And again, in these notes, well, here, I've got... I got more notes very quickly. You have this page. This is not online. This is just a uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10. It's the Greek text. And you can see the Greek words are underlined there. And you can say right here, uh, therefore I take pleasure in, and the, the word weakness is, uh, the word is asthenia, which is translated weakness or frail. There, there's five words underlined there, five Greek words. And I just want you to get a picture of what he's talking about because it, it doesn't really, I mean, yes, we want to press in and find out what does he mean? What was the thorn in the flesh? What does that mean? How was, what was going on? That's, that's a conversation. But what he does then, he jumps over and gives you five total words. He says, I'm rejoicing in all of these things because that was just one example of weakness. He's going to give you that one and four more that would fit in the same category. So was it, 
Was it a, a demon? Was it epilepsy? Was it the Judaizers? Was it the travel? Was it his age? Was it the money? Was it the... It, it was this. But it pertains to all of these. So in other words, whichever one you decide on, I think this is the answer, fine. But it applies to all... Well, here's the five. He says... Therefore, I take pleasure in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, and difficulties for Christ. When for I might be weak, then strong I am. The word weakness is, as you see there, you got one, two, three, four, five written down, is athenia. It means weakness or frailty. It's used to say want of strength, weakness, illness, suffering, calamity, frailty. It is used, in, it is used several times of sickness. So we have a pretty, he says, I was, I was in my weakness, I was made strong. And then he says, I'll rejoice. And he uses that word three times, weakness three times. So there's a good ground for saying Paul was talking about some kind of physical infirmity, some kind of sickness, some kind of problem he had with his physical being. Uh, we don't know what it was. But that's not, that's not an absolute. I'm just saying that's the word to use three times. Matthew 8, 17, use the word. He took our infirmities and carried away our sorrows. Luke 5, 15, or sickness, to be healed of their sicknesses. Romans 8, 6, helps our weaknesses for when we do not know how to pray. Uh, Hebrews 4, 15, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. There in Hebrews 4, verse 5, it is not talking about a physical weakness or physical sickness. It looks like it's talking about the sin nature. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness. I shouldn't say sin nature because Jesus did not have a sin nature, but he had the human likeness and had experienced the weakness of the human being. So be careful with that word weakness yet. Because he was, he was tempted as we are. He had the human nature it says, but was yet without sin. So he knows what it's like to be tempted by sin. So he knows what we're going through when our flesh is wanting to rebel against God. Not that Jesus was in rebellion towards God, but he had the nature of a man. Insults is the second one. It is the Greek word hubris. You've heard of hubris, or the Greek word hubris, but it's similar to that. It's wantonness, insolence, an act of wanton violence. It's used to say insult, injury, outrage, damage, or loss. So it could be he's being insulted. So in one case, it's some kind of it's sickness or illness potentially, that weakness, or just some kind of weakness in the human nature. This is some kind of uh, uh, violence against them. It refers to injury, outrage. It's used just a few times, but in Acts 27, verses 10 and 21, it's the boat that Paul is riding on. The storm is going to cause damage to the ship. It's the same word, hubris, or damage. So he was suffering some kind of damage like the storm was beating on him. So he, he says, I, I, will take, I take pleasure in, now again, when I say he says, I take pleasure, we are not talking about self-inflicted wounds. We're talking about you're doing your best you can with your intellect, your, your endurance, your ability, your will to accomplish the things that God wants you to, but all of a sudden you find a setback it's like, oh, I just give up. It's like, no, 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 embrace that weakness because God is going to come and give you a strength to overcome that so you can keep going with God's plan. It's not talking about, you know, well, if we were all just broke and beaten up and, and unable to do anything, we couldn't read, we couldn't communicate, then that'd be a great life. Well, no, that's, that's, no, that's not the point. Paul's pressing on for greatness in his human ability, but when he falls short of it and something interferes, if it be a sickness or it be a storm, something beating against him, it's like, well, I, I can't do it now. I, 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 can't, I can't do it. And really, this is, this verse right here is there are no excuses right here. It's like, well, I can't. I can't fulfill God's plan for me because I'm sick. I can't fulfill God's plan for me. I don't have any money. I can't fulfill God's plan for me. For, I can't, I can't, I can't. It's like, well, no, no, no. When you can't, then you really can if you want to turn to God. If you really want to do it, you can. God is going to find a way for you to fulfill. Now again, this doesn't mean you can do all things you desire because of Christ. It means if God has called you to do something, you're not limited to your physical ability. God will give you strength in your weakness. Well, let's go on with the other weaknesses. The next word is hardships. Uh, it comes from the Greek word an anke, which means necessity. Sounds like cash. 
uh, it's used to say necessity, constraint, compulsion. There is a need to or force violence. Uh, you can see it popped up in these places, Matthew 18, 7. Uh, for it is an inevitable, that stumbling blocks, it is inevitable, it, it's going to happen. Luke 21, 23, for there will be great distress, the word distress, up on the land. 2 Corinthians, Paul used it in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 4 already in this book when he says, in afflictions, in hardships, and in distresses. So he, there it translates hardships in the New American Standard. 1 Thessalonians 3, 7, in all our distress and affliction. There it's again, distress. The next word for is persecution. It, it's the word diogo mos. Diogo mos, uh, it means persecution. It's used to say chase, pursuit, and persecution. As if you're being chased by something, you're being pursued by something, or persecuted. Uh, and so that, that's different than a sickness. That's different than a storm. That's different than some kind of distress that is coming on the world. This is straight up persecution. And the fifth one is uh, word difficulties as uh, stenokoria. It means, watch this, narrowness of space or difficulty. You, well, it's used to say narrow space, great distress. Uh, there will be tribulation and distress for every uh, person. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. It says that in Romans chapter 2. So there'll be, for every person, there'll be straight, you'll be constrained. You won't be able to move around. It means whatever you're trying to do, there'll be some kind of force limitation. It would just be the human nature. It would be time, whatever. Paul, all those words are included. The thing, I'll read this again in the NIV. The word weakness, therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. And that's the word, that, that's the word, asthenia which means frailty weakness it's used for infirmity like jesus healed diseases uh and that's the first one of the five he says i delight in weakness but he also adds insults hardships persecutions in difficulties which basically i think he's trying to cover i'm not can't speak for paul i'm just reading what he wrote but he gives you five things and that must include the whole human experience of why can't you do this it's it's listed and you can't because you're limited, but you can because in your weakness, whatever those things are, his, and watch this, it says his, his, uh, is, is made perfect, uh, his power is made perfect. Look at the bottom of page 63. I want to see that word perfect, then we got to look at Philippians 4 and quit with that. Remember, God's power is made perfect in your weakness. The Greek word perfect is a, a form of the word teleo which means to bring to an end, to complete, to fulfill. So when it says perfection, it, it doesn't mean, in a sense, without sin. It means you've reached the goal. As Paul says, I've finished the race. The, there's a race set out for you. You will run a perfect race, not perfect as far as sinless, but you will complete. That is what the word is. When you are weak, Christ's strength will help bring about perfection the completeness of God's purpose for your life. Uh, to bring to an end, to complete, to fulfill, God's power is fulfilled and completed in our weakness. When we are weak, that's when we've got to grab God's strength, and that's when God can start with His strength. Obviously, it's the only way you're going to reach perfection in God's plan for your life is for God's strength. If you're going to trust your human ability, or as they were in Corinth, trust their speaking ability and their ability to manipulate people, you're going to achieve some level of human achievement, but it's wood, straw, hay, it's going to pass away. If you can count on God's strength in your point of weakness, you're going to be doing the gold, silver, costly stones, and you're actually going to cross over into eternity with that accomplishment. It's going to be God's perfection of being done in your life. Again, we're not talking about a nature, but we're talking about these things. I want to read one more thing right here. Philippians 4, 6. I'm going to go there and read Philippians 4, 6. Because we talked about prayer, and this is just a nice way. We're talking all this. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. We're talking all of this. If you understand this, the reason I'm explaining this, that in your weakness, God's grace is available, and His, His grace, His power is made perfect in your weakness, that you can stay in what we call faith rest out of Hebrews. Meaning, in your most difficult time, you're going to have faith, belief, and understanding, a conviction that in your weakness, 
there's still strength of God to be attained. Not you overcoming and, and you becoming stronger or having a greater will, but God is going to help you. There's a strength there, and you can then rest in that, and by resting, by trusting, this faith will start to kick in, and you'll, you'll be able to produce. It's also called, we could say, peace that passes understanding, which fits perfectly with what the Corinthians are dealing with. It's a peace, it's a strength that passes the worldly wisdom. It's a peace that only can be understood in the foolishness, which is the cross. And the cross is not foolish, it's God's wisdom. Just like it's God, God's wisdom to have a bunch of fallen creatures with the sin nature to say, I'm going to save them, and then I'm going to empower them, and then I'm going to overcome all evil through humans in a fallen state. It's like, what? No. Just, just drown them in a flood and start over. No, I'm going to send a Savior, redeem them, and start working with that weakness, my strength in their weakness, and we will build the kingdom. We will build the church through Jesus Christ. And that's what is being said here in Philippians. I'm done with this. Chapter 4, verse 6. Uh, I'm going to jump into verse four, chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. The reason I put this in the chapter is when you are in a place of weakness, you do need endurance, you do need healing, you do need finance, you do need guidance, come to God. Bring everything, your, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present all your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now notice right there, you go to God like Paul did, and present all your requests to God. And once you've presented all your requests to God, you can now rest assured, back in faith, I've gone to God, I've presented this to God. And what's God going to do? Well, in our little study tonight, he's going to one, one or two things. He's going to fix it, or he's going to say, no, this is all right. My, in your weakness, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. We're going to go with this. But, no, 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 not but I want it fixed. No, no, you present it to God, and he fixes it, you're good to go. If he says, no, 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 my strength is made perfect in your weakness, fine, whatever the answer is. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It's like... You're good to go. The peace, okay. Well, I, I prayed. Are you good to go? Yeah. Either it's going to get fixed, it's going to be resolved, there's going to be an answer, or God's going to give me strength to work through this to overcome whatever's causing the problem, the delay, and what God's calling me to do. And the peace that passes understanding will come, or I'll just stay in this, this faith rest. And again, that is the wisdom of God. It's not the wisdom of the world. If you are broken, I need this fixed. God can and God will. But God can say, no, 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 that's fine. Because all you got to do is stand on that weakness and look for my strength, and we'll still get it done. And it's not you doing it. It's the strength of God. It's going to lead to perfection of God's will. It's like, oh, now that is a promise. That is, did God answer prayer? Yes, he does. He's going to fix it or give you the strength to overcome it. Well, that's not an answer prayer. Oh, no, no. That's not an answer prayer in Corinth when they want all the good things in the wisdom of the world, but it's an answer to prayer in the wisdom of God. Yes, I'll fix it, or no, I want, won't, but I'll give you the strength to overcome it. It's, we're good here. Nothing's going to stop God, and nothing's going to stop you, so stay in faith rest. Let the peace that passes understanding guard your heart and minds in Christ Jesus. We'll pray. Father, we do thank you again for the chance to look and do these things. We ask that we may not just hear them and, and know them, but actually apply them in our lives, that we would trust you, that we would uh, let these things manifest the strength of God in our own lives, that we can achieve the things you've called us to at this time in history. We pray for this, and we pray for others, that they also may experience the greatness and the glory of God's strength. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for your time.